Isaiah 54, verse 1 through 3. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. I'm going to read one verse, verse 2 from the New English. Make your tent larger. Stretch your tent curtains farther out. Spare no effort. Lengthen your ropes and pound your stakes deep. Amen. From the subject, make room for more. We need to hear from you. We need a word. We need a word from you. If we don't hear. If we don't hear from you. What will we do? What will we do? Loving. Loving you more each day. Show us. Show us your perfect. There is, there is no other way that we can live. Let's say that again. We need, we need to hear from you. We need a word. We need a word from you. If we don't. Let's go this way. Everybody, let's go this way. I saw you running. Let's go this way and get down quickly. God is so good to us. Amen. He is good to us. You saw they ran that way. They're supposed to split up and go separate ways, but they get back in the back and start shooting marbles and everything. Else. They go down and around and come down.
loving you more each day show us your perfect way there is no Listen, if you're in this room and you need a healing in your body, you said, God, I'm, I'm in your presence now. I need a word from you. I need a word on my situation, on my condition. The doctors are saying one thing, God, I need you to say something different. If that's you, stand on your feet right now. Stand on your feet. I need y'all that are sitting down to stretch your hands toward them because I tell you, health issues are real. Health conditions are real. And sometimes we silently hold on to them. Don't share them with anybody, not even our doctors. But I want you to know that we have a great physician. Come on, we have a healer. We don't have anybody that's practicing medicine. Come on, we have somebody that has more medicine than the hem of his garment than every hospital and every pharmacy in the world. So, Father, as these are standing, we're praying, God, even as I stand, that you would touch our physical bodies, that, God, you would supply the healing that we need. God, we pray that you could even work creative miracles where you intervene in such a way that doctors are confounded, uh, that the test results will be different, that we'll go back and God, as the lepers left, as we leave today, things will get healed and things will get better. Things will progressively get better. But even God, we're praying for instantaneous, miraculous signs and wonders that your people can come to your house and expect to be healed in your house. Thank you for the house of prayer. Thank you for the house of bread. God, we thank you for this house of worship and this house of praise. We thank you for a house of healing. So God, we're anticipating healing. We're in expectancy now. We're stepping into a new dimension of faith, God, where we're just believing you against all odds. But there's nothing that's going to prevent us, keep us from doubting that you love us with an everlasting love and that you can heal. And God, even if you don't, we still, like the Hebrew boys, know that you're well able. And Lord God, we won't charge you foolishly for what's going on, but all the appointed days of our lives, we're going to worship you and serve you even until we die. And God, we know then that death is our entrance into eternity. So, God, we win either way. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put those hands together and bless the Lord. I'm grateful to God for all that he's doing and going to do even today. So if you're in anticipation of God speaking to you, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. So, Father God, now, bless us, encourage us, make our ears sensitive to the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do me a favor. You know what we do. Put our hands together for the word of the Lord. I read three verses out of Isaiah 54. And first of all, these three verses is going to benefit us and can only benefit us today when we first come into an understanding of them contextually. Contextually. Taking verses out of context is what leads to error and confusion and misunderstandings about what the Bible means by what the Bible says. Many times these verses have been used in reflecting on the barrenness of Sarah and Hannah and how that they both were dealing with people that had had children and they had none. And so many people take the liberty to say, oh, this is Sarah, this is Hannah, or about them, sing, O barren. But it's good to know some things before we say some things. Like number one, what does it literally say? When you look at passages, the first question you should ask is what does it literally say? What does it actually say? Then secondly, who said it? Who said it? You know, every time you read a verse script in the Bible, it's not the Lord speaking. Even Nebuchadnezzar got a chapter. I Nebuchadnezzar. Number three, you need to know who was it written to. This is going to help you. And then number four, you need to know what was happening at the time. And then number five, you need to know how did it apply then or in that setting at that time? What was it addressing? And then six, how is it applicable to us in our time today? 
We've had the cross. You've got stuff called etymology, where words change, where derivation. You didn't even know the root of the word. Was it Hebrew? Was it Arabic? Was it Greek? And so all of those different things need to at least be taken into consideration before you try to understand a text. And this is what we have so many problems, why we have so many problems in the body of Christ, because somebody says one thing about a verse, somebody says another thing about a verse, and if you've ever been in those crazy Bible studies where you're sitting around as 12 of y'all, and each one of you got a different idea of what the verse means, and you even have the nerve to ask, well, what do you think it mean to you? But if you use these principles, you could come away with the same answer when you apply these methods of interpretation. Can I get about 10 people to say amen? So ignoring context is the tool for false preachers and false teachers and false prophets is what they use to deceive many. Second Peter 3.16 says it like this, talking about Paul and his epistles. He said he writes about this in all his letters. Some things in Paul's letters or epistles are hard to understand. And people who are ignorant and weak in faith explain these things falsely. They also falsely explain the other scriptures, but they are destroying themselves by doing this. Uh, there are people who try to explain, but they're unlearned. And there are people who take the scriptures and the Bible says, twist them as they do the others unto their own destruction. They rest them, they wrestle them, they tangle them up. And uh, because they're not learned, because they don't have any method of biblical interpretation, they can say whatever they want to say about it. But Peter goes on to say that the Bible is not given to private interpretation. Amen. One of the things that you should do when you come to the house of God is be like the Bereans. You listen to what I say, right? But then when you're gone, search the scriptures to see if what the preacher was saying is true. All right. So you have to try the spirits, whether they are of God. So our text is Isaiah 54. And that portion of scripture opens with something that was startling to me when I read it. Verse one, sing, O barren. Sing, O barren, is in reference to the nation of Israel. And not just Hannah, not just Sarah, but the nation of Israel. This message came to them while they were in exile in Babylonian captivity, being dominated by their enemies. Why? Because they refused to trust in the Lord. They had idols in their hearts, and they began to worship the idols of the world. And so they were turned over to Babylonian captivity. They've been swallowed up by the Babylonians. Babylon is always representative of God's judgment, and a rebellious world system a system that opposes the kingdom of Yahweh God. It is worldliness. And so here now the people of God are in the world, captive in the world, estranged from their God. And in these passages, the Lord has given an invitation for them to come now and be participants in their own restoration. Yeah, restoration is promised, but not without an effort. Remember when David lost everything at Ziglag? And he went to the Lord, put on the ephod and said, Father, shall I pursue? And Father, will I recover it all? David just couldn't pray that prayer. God said, yes, you will recover it all. So David had to get up and go get it. Sometimes we have to participate in our restoration and in the restitution of all things. It ain't coming to you. You're going to have to go to it. So in these passages, the Lord has given us an invitation to participate, at least the children of Israel. So the Lord is speaking to Israel. He's speaking to Israel contextually as an estranged wife. Because they are captive and legally separated from God, they're not divorced yet, but they're legally separated. They are now considered barren. Because they're not connected to the vine, they can't bring forth fruit. So they are now barren, unable to produce, unable to meet their original design to be fruitful and to multiply, to increase, to subdue, and to have dominion. They are now bound in the earth, bearing the name of God. Does that sound familiar? Controlled by the world system, unable to freely do what God has called them to do and to be what God has purposed them to be. 
and here they are barren. The lessons are many here, but the one that stands out to me as I read this passage above them all is the command to sing. The command to sing is to sing in expectation of things turning around. You can run ahead of me. To sing in expectation of things changing. They were to sing in the expectation of being reunited to their God, who the text says, if you keep reading, is their husband. Listen to verse four and five, or five and six. It says, Isaiah 54, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will, or your husband will, call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. Did you see that? So your maker, he says, is your husband. Jehovah God, in this context, will take back his people into the old relationship that they had when they were young and in love. He's going to take them back as a man takes back the wife of his youth after she's been rejected for a long time. You still don't get that. Now, remember, the Bible says, even in the law, that a man could not put away his spouse or his wife except for the cause of fornication or to go whoring after other gods. So here they are set aside now. They're apart from God. They've been put out by God. They've been set aside because of their fornication with other gods and their mingling. When the Bible talks about fornication, it's not just between two people, but it is the love of other gods. It is having some other God before him. And our God, watch me, is a jealous God. And he says, you'll have no other gods before me. So hear the Lord speaking to us today. When he says we get back together, He says, I'm coming with all that I am, all my stuff, so make room. The Lord is saying, you're in bondage right now. We're separated. You're desolate. You're not producing much of anything, but soon you will have more children than you formerly had. And then all of those that are around you boasting have themselves. Remember, David said, that the, why is the wicked prosper? You know, he, he looked around, he said, they got more money, they living like hell. They got the best job, they living like hell. They driving the nicest cars or chariots, and they living like hell. David said, I would have lost my mind. I would have slipped, I would have given up had I not gotten to the house of God and heard the end of the matter, that all of that's going to pass away. But when you have a relationship with God, that's better than substance, stuff, and things. A little bit with the Lord is much better, listen, than a whole lot without him. Just a little bit. So the Lord is saying, you're in bondage, we're separated, you're desolate, but I'm going to do something. You're not producing much of anything, but soon you're going to have more children than you formerly had. Why? Because when you return to me, he says, our bond will be so strong that I'm going to impregnate you with new seed, new vision, and give you new hope and the future that I promised you. (laughs) Jeremiah was a contemporary of Isaiah, and he prophesied in Jeremiah 29, 11 about that. God says, I know what I'm doing, and I have plans for you, not to do you evil or do you harm, but a plan to give you a future and the hope that you hope for. And I got provision for you. They were in Babylonian captivity. And they begin to complain and they were in bondage. But God says, don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing. And so here Yahweh is saying to them through the prophet, I'm going to bring you back. You're going to come back. We're going to reconnect. So make room. Lord is calling his people while they're in captivity to prepare for increase. That's all he's doing. He's calling his people while they're in captivity to prepare for expansion. He's calling people while they're in captivity uh, to come to him for his divine protection, his divine provision. Like the phoenix, I think, out of the ashes, he's saying they will rise. And their enemies will become their footstools. 
So here it is. Here it is. Israel or the people of God are going to be restored and is likened unto a barren woman who's now um, unable to bear anything because they ain't got no hood. How important is this for us to know this, right? In that day, a barren woman or even a widow was not a good thing. Being one was not a good thing. It carried a whole lot of shame and disgrace. Remember, every Hebrew woman believed that they would one day give birth to Messiah. And when your womb is shut, then you're not included in that possibility. And so in this case, their rebellion against God has caused their captivity, which has caused their barrenness. They were experiencing the shame and disgrace and humiliation that comes along with being barren and being deserted. But if you know how God uses captivity, then you know that this captivity is just for a season. God uses our captivity and says, I don't care what it looks like. Things are going to turn around. Trouble would not last always. I'm coming to show up. Why? Because Hosea said he's married to the backslider. So here's what he says. Sing, O barren. Say that. Sing, O barren. So here we go. So the context is that the Lord is promising that their deliverance will be so complete that they're going to have to expand the place of their dwelling. They had become small and weak and were diminishing because they were apart from their God. But God promises to strengthen them and to cause them to flourish once again. So based on this promise, they were going to have to enlarge their tents. They were going to need to make room for more. Say that. Make room for more. So in order for us to make application, we have to keep some things in mind. Things like all scripture. It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man and woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That the scriptures give us to know that we need every word of it. Remember the Bible said what was written aforetime was written for our learning. That we through comfort and patience of the scriptures might have hope. There's nothing that is written that's not applicable to us. We just got to know how to apply it. We got to know how the cross impacted it. We got to know is that provision still available to us in Christ and so that's what's happening here right so for us this text is a call to those of us who are living in a captivity to a Babylonian system that we even on this side of the cross need to get ready for the return of the glory of God there's a glory that's returning to the people of God that's going to cause growth and expansion despite the times. I don't care what you hear on CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, all these different places, there's a glory that supersedes. There's a weight of God that is coming forth that's going to correct all of the ills in our life. And out of the ashes, we're going to rise. There's a glory that's going to aid us in moving beyond our current boundaries and our current limitations that's been caused by this worldly system and living in the midst of a generation that does not know God. An untoward generation, a generation that's bent against God, that is self-centered and conceited, and, and a, a generation that does not acknowledge that our God reigns, acknowledges many gods trying to coexist with all other so-called gods but to us which are saved there's only one God there's only one Lord one faith one baptism one God and Father who's above us all through us all and in us all so now we can go with the text so now that we know the context we can make application when this word was given Israel was being led captive or held captive and had become barren in every aspect of their life, right? Yet the prophet says in Isaiah 54 and 1, here it is again, sing, O barren. Say that. Sing, O barren. Why? They were broke. I don't mean broke like no money broke. They were broken. Come on, like most of the vending machines around town. They were out of order, right? They weren't functional. They weren't functioning properly. God had created them and charted them to be fruitful and to multiply, to have dominion, to subdue. They had a promise of their seed being like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. But in captivity, they were dwindling 
in captivity, they were diminishing. But Genesis 22, 17 had been pronounced over their forefathers. I will certainly, he said, bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond your number like the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of the enemies. He said, I'm going to increase you. I'm going to multiply your seed. They're going to be like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And here they are. That promised seed is now dwindling in captivity. It's now dwindling. It's now being hindered. There is no fruitfulness. Now, I want you to keep in mind that there was a mixed multitude in that captivity. There was a mixed multitude. There were those who had no clue about who God was. They had no clue about what God had promised. They had no clue about what God was capable of doing. I want you to make an application today because many of them were born into captivity. Come on. Come on, y'all. Many of them, like today, we're making an application today. They only knew captivity all their lives. They only knew Baptists. They only knew Methodists. They only knew Presbyterian. They only knew a and me. They only knew tradition. They only knew religion all their life. They had never heard a sure word from God. They had never ever seen the glory of God. They don't know anything about the glory of the former house. They don't know anything about that. That's what we're facing today. A whole new breed of people that have been born into this present darkness. This Babylonian worst worldly system of separation from God is all they know they think it's strange that you tell them to live right to do right to don't fornicate and obey your parents come on to respect your elders they have no idea because all they know is what they know what they learn from social media and on their cell phones and on their iPads and on their computers all they know is the rebellion that they see in the cartoon animated movies and all of this kind of stuff they know not God they're extreme they were born into it they were born into an era like this. They have no recollection of what we call the glory of God. So here's what I hear the Lord saying to us as we enter into this new dimension. Amos 9 11. In that day, he says, I will restore the fallen house of David. I will repair its damaged walls for them from the ruins. I will rebuild it and restore its former glory from the ruins, from the ashes. They shall rise and I will restore its former glory. God's going to restore the glory that he had on the day of Pentecost when the power of God fell and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, cloak and tongues of fire sat upon each one of their heads people were there from all over the world and they heard the gospel in their own language the wonderful works of God and 3,000 souls were saved that day 4,000 were added after that and then great multitudes after that and then the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky are sitting in front of me today because he has given the Gentiles good God Almighty to the gospel and God has a plan for us to return his former glory. The tabernacle of David shall be restored. Praise 24-7. Worship 24-7. You wake up in the morning blessing God. You go down at night blessing God. You don't need to be in a crowd. You don't need a ham and organ. You don't need a keyboard. All you need is opportunity. All you need is breath because let everything that have breath praise the Lord. I believe that if the former glory returns, that it can break the yokes off of the necks of these young folk that have been born into this darkness. Ah, those who know not the Lord. There's a generation, the Bible says, that know not God. So listen to what God is going to do. Listen to the word, Haggai 2.9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace said the Lord of hosts. Listen, you don't have to have remembered the former glory, but when this glory hits, good God Almighty, just know this, it's greater than the former glory. When this glory hits, just remember this, God is the one that sent it his glory and is sending it for his glory. And I believe there's some people who have been born into captivity whose eyes are going to come open. I believe that there's some people who don't know God who are going to get to know God. Come on, out of Zion is coming forth the love 
oh, I believe the Bible is true. They're coming from the north. They're coming from the south. They're coming from the east. They're coming from the west. They're coming to the house of God. They're coming to the mountain of God. They're coming to running from the world, running from the world in this, running from the captivity, running from the Babylonian system, running from this government, running from other governments, running from strange people, authoritarian people, running from weird people, strange people. They're coming. They're coming. They're going to run from that. They're going to look for truth. They're going to look for truth. They're going to be looking for God. And we got to be here when they come. Matter of fact, we got to go get them. If we don't reflect on this promise, then there can't be expectancy. If we can't even preach to people that there's a glory coming, if they've never seen it, and we don't give them hope of a glory coming, how do we expect them? To return. So notice Isaiah speaks in terms of dimensions. He calls for new measurements. He said lengthen and, and strengthen and widen and large, expand. All of that's dimensions. Isaiah 54 also uses the symbolism of a tent, a tabernacle. This speaks, of course, to a temporary place of dwelling. What does that mean? A tent is not to be a place of permanence. Watch this, where you can't change it at will. See that? It's not intended to be a permanent residency where you just have to live one way forever. Right? A tent is built in order for you to be able to move, to expand, to enlarge, and change it when you have to. A tent is a temporary place of refuge while we're on our journey. It speaks to the fact that where you are does not have to be where you stay. When you're tabernacling, you could be here today and there tomorrow. Come on, somebody saw you last week depressed, but you have tabernacled to joy. Come on, it means that you don't have to have the same attitude today that you're going to have tomorrow because in a tent, you can just get up and move. You can change some things. You can expand. You can shut some things. <laughs> Let me give you a tent. A tent. When God is moving, you have to be able to pick up and move when He says move. When you're tabernacling, when God moves, you can move just like that. So you got to get this in your spirit. God enables us to tabernacle to move. So a tent is that temporary place. So even our bodies have been compared to tents, to tabernacles. This is symbolic of our temporary earthly existence before we enter eternity. We're just passing through, y'all. Remember, we're citizens of heaven while we're here even on earth. But the day is coming where this earth and have a tabernacle will dissolve. And we're going to have a... Let me read it. 2 Corinthians 5.1 It says this, For we know that if our earthly house of what? This tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. Once we put off the tabernacle, we'll have a house. We'll have a home, a permanent dwelling. Come on, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I'm going to pay a place for you that where I am. You can be also a permanent place. We'll live eternally with him forever. Come on, y'all are dwelling with God. That's permanent forever. But right now we're tabernacling. Right now we're just passing through. You got to see this. So to make application, I believe that the Lord is calling us to enlarge the place of our tent, to stretch our tent curtains wide while we're journeying. While we're on this journey. We need to evaluate our condition. He says, make your tent bigger, larger. Do it by faith, in faith. Amen. He says we should do it ex in expectancy of what's about to take place. I, I think he's calling us to open up our hearts and our minds to be able to have more. Right? And having a relationship with him will help us to manage the more when it comes. Hope y'all seeing this. 
The Lord is calling for those who may not have what they've been, watch this, hoping for, for a long time. How many of y'all have been living in hope of some things for a long time? So the Lord is calling for those who may not have what they've been hoping for to go ahead, hear me good now, and start making room for it. Faith in faith and start making room for it. Preparing yourself for it. Living in expectancy for it. Don't just sit there like a gator by the lake or like a water on a pickle. Just don't sit there moping and groaning and complaining about what you don't have. Prepare. It's like a woman that's in travail. When they scoop her up and the water breaks and you go to the hospital and you have the baby and they want to get rid of you now in a day, a day and a half. But in that day, a day and a half, somebody at the house is preparing the room. Come on for the baby. Somebody's fixing up the bassinet in expectancy of that baby coming in. Come on, somebody and I'm painted the room either blue or pink and nowadays rainbow and don't tell her what they do. But somebody is preparing a place for that child to come home. I promise you because the promise was in your womb and the seed was put in you by God and there's something that you expect you don't want, want to be pregnant for the rest of your life and so many people are just pregnant with dreams and pregnant with destiny and pre pregnant with purpose it's time to give birth and in order to give birth if you're going to give birth prepare the room prepare the place prepare the tent enlarge it get ready for it and expect it to come Somebody say, I'm expecting, I'm expecting, I'm expecting. So this entails us opening our eyes. I said last week, beginning to see things from God's perspective. Perspective. You have to see yourself with, watch this, unlimited possibilities. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think exceeding I mean unlimited possibilities see yourself as able to secure and to possess whatever God has in store for you regardless of who says otherwise remember Joseph you can't share your vision and dream with everybody everybody ain't happy about the love that the father has for you and the love that you have for the father Everybody not happy that you walking with God and living for God and sowing and giving and being blessed and everybody ain't happy about that. But there are some people that are signed by the enemy to keep you doubting and making you think that you will never get what God has promised you. But I come to announce today the devil is alive. I need about 10 people that know what I'm talking about. They said I never make it. They said, I'll never be here today. They said, i never amount to anything. But I'm glad to say I'm still on my way. Come on. So then, they, they said you wouldn't make it this far. And you ain't finished yet. Good God Almighty. It does not matter how long you've been waiting already. Remind yourself that God has a set time limit on whatever your captivity is. For Israel, it was 70 years. Judah, 70 years. And then it was going to be over. That's what God said. Not a day early, not a day late. In Egypt, they were there 40 years. 40 years. Not a day early, a day late. Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Not a day early or a day more. But he only spent three days in the grave. Good God Almighty. Jonah only spent three days in the belly of that fish. Come on. Every captivity, every bondage has an expiration date. Everything you're going through has an expiration date. Some of y'all that been to prison, you know what I'm talking about. You've been to jail. You start counting that calendar down because you know the judge gave you a certain date. And when you do your time, it's time to be set free. And I promise you there's somebody here. You're just doing time. So just flip the calendar because I promise you there's a day when you get out. There's a day when you get set free. There's a day when you get ready to go. You can go home now. You can be reunited with your family. You can go home now. You can have your life back again. It's coming. 
coming, y'all. There's an expiration date. I'm about to preach myself happy. The tents symbolize something very important for us. They symbolize that we are on a journey. And I hope you understand that I'm talking about a spiritual journey. This expansion or this next dimension or new dimension is not just about material accumulation only. It's a power, but that ain't the focus. See, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things that the heathen seek after, he'll just add them to you. This dimension of expanse is about our spiritual growth, right? I told y'all last week, it's, it's about depending or deepening our relationship with God, depending totally and solely upon him. This is about us increasing in our knowledge of God, right? This is about us coming to an understanding of his will and his ways. And I believe the Lord is trying to get some of us, watch this, if it get good, to leave our comfort zones. Maybe not what you think. Many people have limited themselves by offering God the things that they can do themselves. We come even to a ministry or we come to God and <laughs> what we have to offer is what we do. We, 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 we have our service to you God is what I've learned. We, we, we come and want to do what's easy for us. I am this. I am that. And I want to do that here. But hold the press. God is calling some folk to do what they've never done before. Now don't mind you listening. Don't mind leaning. Things that you may not think about that God may be requiring of you. Like submitting to somebody else's vision, call, and purpose. Like fitting in where you're needed as a part of a greater move of God. Like becoming like Jesus. Not as I will, but thy will. As thou will. See, I'm preaching. So we have to take the limits off of God because we think we have something to offer as if God didn't give it to us to begin with. And when we think that because we're good at something, that somebody needs that thing at that particular time, when God is saying, don't limit yourself. Don't get locked in to what you're familiar with. Don't get locked in to what you can do. Don't, don't, don't read the, your own press. Don't be impressed with your own bio. Your last job performance don't matter here. It's not how well you did over there. And don't, don't fudge your, your resume. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't exaggerate. I'm sitting here looking at you. You, you did this, 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 and you're looking for employment from me? If you did all of that, I should be working for you. But if I break your resume down, oh, I see it was just a little this and a little that and a little this, but it sure sound good. Again, don't listen to your own press. Come on, don't, don't, don't be impressed with yourself. You see, everybody can't lead. Everybody can't be in charge. Everybody can't be the star. Everybody can't get on stage. Everybody can't grab the microphone. You got to know where you need it. I've said it for years. It's not how well you work and do what you do. It's how well you work and do what you do with others. If you can't get along with others, if you can't love others, if you can't serve others, then you can't serve. You, you, you can't serve. I don't care how impressive your resume is. I don't care how wonderful you think you are. I'm preaching. Now so I don't cause somebody to have a panic attack. 
It's okay to be faithful in what you have been assigned to do and you've been doing it for a long time. Remain faithful. You're in authority, under authority. Here's what I believe God is saying. Now. You can't think that what you're doing with ease is all that you can do. That's all I'm saying. The Lord is calling us to remove any and all self-imposed limitations that we have put on ourselves. He wants us to be available like a good soldier for any assignment as needed. God has given us manifold grace. It's available for us to do what we have never dreamed of being able to do. God will empower you to do what you never dreamed of. So many people have discovered their purpose by doing it. So many people realize that I'll never be a teacher and then wind up teaching a class and feel the power of God, the grace of God on them and all of a sudden fall in love with something that they've been fighting all their lives. Manifold grace says when you show up to do something, I'm going to work through you. All right. I'm going to do it and get some glory for it and make you think you had something to do with it. I'm at work in you to do my good will and pleasure. I just need you to show up. I need you to make yourselves available. Come on, y'all. We got to begin to believe that with God, all things are possible. So here's I'm closing this. God is calling us to stretch our tents wide. Isaiah 54 and 2. Make your tent larger. Stretch your tent curtains farther out. Now, in the spirit. Watch this. He's calling us to enlarge not just our physical tent, but our understanding of who he is. We have to be cognizant of who God is and what God has done. And, and now what the Lord requires of us in the spirit. Right? There are three things in particular he's calling us into. Three dimensions. And this is the message. Number one, the Lord is calling us into a new dimension of love. Come on, say that with me. The Lord is calling us into a new dimension of love. The one thing that we know about God is found in 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, the emphasis in John's writing here is not that God is love. We got that greater love. We got that. But if you don't love, you are not of God. Right? God is love and we ought to be like him and we are called to be like him then we have to come we have to watch this expand our capacity to love at this hour of division in our nation bitterness and strife and the world we now live the Lord is calling his people to love one another just the way he has loved us right he's calling us to love the lost just like he loved us. He's calling us, come on y'all, out of the mundane di dimension of limited human love. He's calling us out of a love that's conditional, a love that is self-centered and picky. Uh, the Lord wants to expand our capacity to love all men indiscriminately. Love man the way he loved man. First John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now that's worth shouting on right there, but I'm gonna leave that alone. Now remember I used the word picky. What did I mean? Meaning we can't pick and choose who we love. We can't only love those who love us or love those who are like us. We can't only love when it's convenient and when it's comfortable. The love that God is calling us to is without limits. It's a copy. It's unconditional and it's selfless. I, I can prove it. Let me get a witness out here among y'all that are listening to me even over the internet and over the airways that, that, that God loves the unlovable. Now, if you thought you were all that in a bag of chip and a two point bit of butter and God had to love you because you were just lovable, you done missed it. Because all of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. I need a witness. I need to get somebody to testify that God also loves the ungrateful. If you ever lived your life selfishly doing your own thing, party people, time to get funky, y'all. If you've ever been out there on the dance floor minding your own business, no knowledge of God, 
and just taking life for granted and thinking that you got your job because of your education and that you got your house because somebody left you some money or left you the house and you forget that it was God you're ungrateful I need somebody to know that God loves even the ungrateful come on y'all I need somebody to testify that God loves the lost and the hurting. That somebody here used to be a no good, good for nothing, low down, scum of the earth, backbiting, home mongering, sinner on your way to hell. I need you right in here. Somebody here was swinging on the pole. Come on, drunk at the bar. Come on, somebody here had to have a driver every night designated. Come on, somebody here full of weed, speed. Somebody here was shooting and carrying on, smoking. Somebody here was acting the fool. And God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. I'm gonna come on. Somebody here was caught in same sex relationships and going through. Uh, somebody here, you were messed up, and God came and showed you his love and let you choose to love on him. And he took you away from your partner and brought you to him. Took you away from that man, that woman, and brought you to him. God so loved the world. God loves us with an everlasting love. Somebody here ought to just jump up and high five yourself and shout, God also loves folk that don't deserve it because I promise you you don't deserve it I promise you you don't deserve it all you gotta do is think about what you did this week you don't deserve it all you gotta do is think about what you were thinking about last night and you don't deserve it with your crazy self and God loves you with an everlasting love number two number two the Lord is calling us to enter into a new dimension of service say that The Lord is calling us to enter into a new dimension of service. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. What did Jesus do? Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. What did Jesus do? He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He comforted the broken heart. Jesus gave his life a ransom for many. Jesus calls us to follow his example. The Bible said how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. We're called to serve all that are oppressed of the devil. Everybody, every meth head, every fentanyl use every crack here he's called us y'all to heal and to deliver and to set free all that are oppressed of the devil all that are oppressed period in life all that are possessed in life God's called us to those who cannot call upon him themselves he's called on us to go out and preach the gospel because how can they call on him and whom they not believe and how can they believe on him and whom they not heard and how can they hear without a preacher and how can they preach except they be sick So he said, go, not stay. He said, go ye, not stay. He said, go ye. They're waiting on us. They're bag people waiting on us. Shopping carts full of all of their possessions waiting on us. They're prostitutes selling their bodies waiting on us. They're people out here on these streets waiting on us. People under that overpass. People out there in them woods, they're waiting on us. We've got to be a light. We've got to be a light. We've got to shine. We've got to be here. we got to put down our stake. His battle over us is love. Love Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. And watch this, faith working by love. But watch this, love is not in word only, it's in deed. If you really love, you're going to serve. And then lastly, the Lord is calling us into a new dimension of faith. Say that. The Lord is calling us into a new dimension of faith. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now listen, there's no such thing as now faith. Get that out of your system. Chapter 10 does not where the chapter ends. It's one book. It ended right there before now faith. And so, so many people, instead of kept reading, and says, here's what happened before. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It wasn't establishing a doctrine called now faith. And so many people have jumped up and they got now faith. What I got, later faith? So you got to have now and later. That's the only way. How many of y'all remember now and later? You got to have now and later. 
faith it's not just now faith in a category and so now your faith gonna work for you because you got now faith you need to have faith now but there's no doctrine called now faith right so he said now faith is the something things hope for evidence of things not seen faith is the foundation of our whole journey with God we walk by faith we live by faith we follow God by faith living by faith though can be scary and you know what I mean because our faith wavers our faith get weak sometimes. I get a little bit of weak sometimes. I get a little bit of weak sometimes. Our faith battles doubt. And our faith gets tested often by our circumstances and conditions. Our faith is constantly tested by circumstances and conditions. So what is our hope then if our faith gets low? What is our hope then if our faith wavers? What is our hope then if our faith gets funny? 2 Timothy 2.13, I'm glad you asked. The Bible says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. I didn't think I'd get through with that right there. God's faithfulness to us is steadfast, unchanging, unfailing. He is faithful even when we are faithless. Faithful is he that have promised. So the Lord is calling us to stretch our tent curtains wide to enlarge our faith and grow in our trust in him. He's calling us to new faith. It's sounding to me like the Lord literally just wants us to grow up in him, to grow up in him, to become all that he have designed us to be and ordained us to be, to see it as being conformed into the image of, of, of his son day by day, Jesus Christ, we're to be conformed. And not to forget that Paul said, even after all of the great accomplishments that he had done in life, sitting in the prison, he says that I might know him. And I just want to be in that position to where I never think I know enough about him to say to God, I got it from here. I want to constantly be a learner. The learner always excels the learned. I want to constantly be in a position of adapting and changing and expanding and increasing and being fruitful and multiplying and subduing and having dominion. I don't ever want to get to a place to where I think I have arrived. I don't want to listen to that GPS system. When you got to church here, it says you have arrived. The devil is a liar. You still got to keep going. You got to go back home today. You got to go to work tomorrow. You may have gotten to a particular point, but when you get to that point, you got to get a little bit of godly uneasy and you got to get up and say God what is it that you would have me to do what's next how many of you want to become more like the Lord every day I'm sure every child of God wants that I think for their lives but we must never forget that there is a devil we must never forget that we have worldly enemies and on top of that you must never forget that you have you and your flesh your flesh and that makes it harder than anything. There's an enemy, and then there's an enemy enemy. Anybody here ever discovered that your flesh does not want to completely surrender to God's will? Your flesh does not want to align itself to his purposes without a fight. Your greatest fight is with yourself. Uh-huh, ain't worry about nobody else. Paul said it like this in Romans 7. I don't really, verse 15, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So it ain't, it ain't problem with God, it's me. Verse 17, so I'm not the one doing wrong, it's sin living in me that does it. In this flesh, he said, dwelleth no good thing. Even though you're born again, there's an old nature. That nature has to die daily. You have to put off the old man with his deeds and put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you feed that old nature, if you feed that old man, he will rise up, become stronger. If you're feeding him more than you're feeding the new man, which is in Christ with the word of God, then your old man will dominate your life. And then when it's time to make a God decision, you got this old man that's stronger, come on, than your spirit man, and you wind up torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. You wind up trying 
trying to do what was right, but then you keep doing what's wrong because you haven't died to yourself. You have to crucify yourself daily and take up your cross daily. I know we were crucified with Christ and we live yet not us, but Christ live in us. But every day, if any man doesn't deny himself, if any man doesn't deny mama, daddy, sister, brother, and yea, even himself, the Bible says you can't be my disciple. You got to kill that old man. You got to recognize that old man. You got to remember where you came from. You got to remember what you used to do. You got to remember how you used to do it. And so that you don't, do, you know that that glorify God. So even though I'm tempted to do it, I've got to have my spirit man strong enough to where the spirit man says, shut up and sit down. Come on, talk to me here. That's why you need to worship harder. That's why you need to praise harder. That's why you need to get into the word. I'm getting ahead of myself. Isaiah 54 2, we have this clarion call to enlarge the place of our tent. Basically, it's a call for the people of God to expand, to increase, to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do this even when it appears the enemy is winning. Also, I believe he's talking about the expansion of spiritual territory, even in the natural, possessing new lands, doing bigger and greater things, taking physical territory for the kingdom. This word in Isaiah is about daring to dream big. Daring to dream big, daring to be, daring to have a vision even in the dark. It's about believing that whatever it is that we even think of, God can do more than that. Stretching our tent curtains wide is so that we can impact and influence the things that are around us and that for his glory. Just like we're doing as a ministry for some of y'all that just come, Johnny, come lately. Let me help you some with something. Just like we're doing right now. We didn't complain about the public school system only. We started our own school. So you can, you can complain or you can do something. But with a dream and with a vision, you can manifest what it is that you see that can alleviate what it is that you see. So instead of complaining about the public school system, we develop our own school system. We didn't complain about unemployment in our area. We created jobs. I'm preaching. That's enough to shout on that we can go home. We didn't run to the suburbs when we were able to move to, to get away from the homeless and the needy. We, we opened up our, our, our tents. We made wide our curtains. We lengthened our cords. We drove deep our stakes. And we just stood and started serving in and everybody that would come our way. Y'all still don't get this. With just a dream, with just a vision, in a prayer tower, with a legal pad, with a pen. God, what is it that you want me to do? And God, you're going to need to show me that we can get this done. You're going to need to support this dream. I need it. God, so you telling me what telling me what to do? And I hear people all the time talking about, God, I need this and God, I need that. All I said to God is, I need the oil. I need the, I need you, God. You do all the rest of stuff the way you want to do it because you can say by many or by few. I don't need to tell God what I need before I can do something. I need to just say yes to God and watch him do something through me. Y'all not helping me here. Somebody get delivered on that one piece right there by yourself. Stop waiting till you get all your ducks in the row because if you had to have all your ducks in the row, the Bible said that if you wait until everything is perfect, you'll never make anything happen. You just got to be available to God And when God says move You got to move When God says go I'm preaching I got to close this y'all I got to close this So then this is all about us Using our gifts Our talents Our resources To serve others And advance the kingdom Potter's house And folk that are listening to me online And those that are here Bear with me This message is going to be long for a reason But I need y'all to hang in here Until God is done with you We're all called to be salt and light In a world that is desperate desperately in need of hope and love the love of God Jesus right now so Isaiah says listen to this lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes this is about digging deep and fortifying our spiritual foundation it's about building our lives on the solid rock of Christ and anchoring our hope in his unchanging promises. This is about being able to stand firm in the face of trials and tribulations and persevering in faith even when the going gets tough. Will the son of man find faith on the earth when he returns? Enduring, persevering faith. 
this is some next level stuff here, God. I got that. I know what I'm talking about. This is the next level. I feel it. I hear what I'm saying. It's another realm. It's another dimension. Isaiah 54 is some new dimension stuff going on here, hidden in this passage. But I'm sensing a new spiritual awakening to another dimension of understanding and existence in Christ for the people of God. I'm sensing that we're going to be called and given a greater understanding of God's power, of God's sovereignty, of God's providence over both earthly circumstances and those forces and powers in that other realm that we can't see because we're not fighting against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. God's going to allow us to maintain what we're doing here with increased potency and also see in the heavenlies what it is that is trying to block us or stop us. Like Daniel, who the angel Gabriel said that there was the prince of the kingdom of Persia that withstood your prayer for 21 days. But don't worry, God sent Michael to handle him so that I can get through to you with the answer to your prayer. He made it very plain to Daniel as to what was going on. You missed it. Some of us don't know why we don't have the answer to our prayer. Some of us don't know why we've been waiting so long. I believe God is going to give us a peep into the heavenlies as he's done with Daniel chapter 10 and say to you, it's because there's a principality called. There's the, a, a, a power called. There's a dominion called. There's something in your life that you can call. God is going to reveal to us what's hindering, come on, the answers to our prayer and what's hindering us from reaching our purpose and our destiny. I believe that we're going to begin to see in the spirit realm and once we see in the spirit realm and recognize who it is we can rest there's a story I believe about Luther or about one of the other great preachers of Spurgeon that uh, was, was in his room and was in bed he felt the very presence of evil he, he couldn't sleep he felt the very tangible presence of an eerie presence of a demon in his room and so most people would get out of the room most people would run but because of his knowledge and understanding of God <clears throat> it is said that what he did is looked over and he sensed that it was an evil presence and he saw this figure and he said oh it's just you and rolled over and went to sleep come on when you know what it is and you know you're already a conqueror Come on, when you know what it is and you know you've already overcome it, come on, when you know what it is and you know that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, you can roll over and go to sleep because the devil can only go so far. God's got him on a leash. Come on, y'all. He might touch your body, but he can't touch your soul. And then when you know what it is, you can say like they said in the book of Zechariah, Satan, the Lord out of Zion, rebuke you. Uh-huh. Satan, the Lord out of Zion. I'm, I'm, I, I, the Lord has designed us to win Jesus whooped the devil on the cross he made a show of him openly triumphed over him and then he completely conquered death and gave us legal authority in the earth when he got up out of the grave like Gideon when he was threshing wheat in a wine prayer. There was a time when there was a judge that was threshing wheat. He was afraid of the Mennonites, the, the enemies of God at that time would come and ravish their crops every seven years or so. And, and, and so now he's just making something for him and his family to eat in a wine press, threshing wheat. Uh, and, 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 and Gideon is there. And with that said, not only does, does God know where you are, but God knows who you are. You didn't get it. Not only does he see us where we are, but the Lord sees us uh, where we should be. He showed up to Gideon and Gideon is afraid. Gideon hadn't seen God move. And God says to Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Somebody needs to hear that today. You've been hiding. Your hands have been tied. The enemy has been prevailing. If it ain't one thing, it's another. It doesn't appear that you're going to make it. It doesn't appear the marriage is going to make it. It doesn't appear the children are going to get right. It doesn't appear that your prayers are effective. It doesn't appear that your praise is worship, working. It doesn't appear that your worship is working. I came to tell you, call you mighty man, 
mighty woman of valor. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous appraileth much. You've got to praise when you ain't got no more strength. Just a little bit of breath left. You got to keep on fighting. You got to keep asking. You got to keep seeking. You got to keep knocking. It doesn't matter what you haven't seen. It doesn't matter what you haven't heard. It's now what do you see and what are you hearing? I'm calling you out of darkness. I'm calling you out of bondage. I'm calling you back to God. I'm calling you to dependency upon Him. I'm calling you to hear His voice. I'm calling you to bow your knee. I'm calling you to humble yourself. I'm calling you to draw nigh to God. I'm calling you to resist the devil. I'm calling you to take a stand. I'm calling you to be bold. I'm calling you to be strong. I'm calling you to be courageous. I'm calling you to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. I'm calling you to stay in the race. I'm calling you not to give up. I'm calling you not to throw in the towel. I'm calling you to endure hardness as a good soldier. I'm calling you to fight the good fight of faith. I'm calling you to overcome. I'm calling you to lift up your voice like a trumpet, to sound the alarm I'm calling you to do that I'm calling you I'm calling you to it so with all that said not only does he see us where we are but he sees it where we should be he has higher heights sit down one last time deeper depths and greater dimensions of himself that he wants us to experience so I'm closing with this y'all bottom line you need to leave here today Knowing that whatever your captivity is and however long it has been or will be, God's always in control. The Lord is the ultimate authority. His plans and his purposes will prevail. I'm going to tell you all again, God knows exactly what he's doing. He's got this. I don't know who y'all with, but I'm with him. Israel was being held hostage by the Babylonians, world system, and they had diminished the number and strength. This witness of them in captivity was not a good one. They were being bullied. And today, I promise you, if you really had eyes to see, you'll see how this Babylonian system is bullying the church of Jesus Christ and trying to bully us and shut us down. They had lost their joy. They had hung up their harps on the willow trees. Their influence had dwindled. Their God seemed far from them, place of them. They were now barren and they were estranged from their husband. They were put out of the house of God and were now living in tents. And in the midst of this, here's what God says. Is it on the screen? Say it loud. Say it again. I don't care what it looked like, what you're going to do. That's why the word of the Lord says in Isaiah 54 and 2, make your tent larger. Stretch your tent curtains farther out. Spare no effort. Lengthen your ropes. And pound your stakes deep. When we reconnect with God, when we get right with God, and we start walking in this new dimension, we're going to have to make room for what's coming. That's why I said to you today, before we ever get started, I said to you today, make room for more. For some, there was no expectation. For some, it was just another topic. But for others who are dreamers, who have vision, who understand their purpose, who realize that they have nothing to offer God that God hadn't already given to them. For those who just want to be in an authentic move of God and want to be in proper alignment, who want to fit the pattern so they can see the glory, because the concept is first the pattern and then the glory. When they were to build the temple a particular way, exactly the way God said it, once it was complete, then the glory comes. 
And I'm telling y'all, when we get our act together, the glory will come. Not even collectively and corporately, but individually. In your own house, on your own job, with your own families, in your own mind. You get it together, and here comes the glory. If you ever remember the wife here, extrained, if you ever had a relationship with God that was genuine, that was pure. How many of y'all can remember when you first got saved, but nothing really mattered but Jesus? You couldn't brush your teeth without Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Your feet wouldn't hit the floor without calling on the name of the Lord. And God is saying, this is what the picture is. Because you went a whoring after other things and put other gods before me, became idolatrous, began to fornicate with the world. I've set you aside for a while, but I hear your cry. So go ahead and sing, old bear. Come on, make room because I'm coming home. Come on, make room because we're getting ready to reunite. Come on, make room because we're coming back together. Come on, add a room onto the house, expand, open up another dimension of your dwelling. Because when I come, I'm coming with everything I am. With everything I got, with everything I am, I'm coming. Everybody standing. Stay if you can just a moment. As I try to minister this to you, as I try to get you to see what God is doing in the midst of his church and his people. I'm not here for show. I'm not here for myself. I spend time by myself sitting in the presence of God alone talking to God about you but let me just say this I don't do a whole lot of talking I try to do a lot of listening I can't tell God how to do it but I can listen to what he wants to do and when I find passages like this one that says look at the state of the people Look at it contextually. Now make application of that where you live. See yourself the way God sees you. See yourself from God's perspective. Realize that what God has done, he will do. What he will do is predicated on what he has already done. Know the mind of God. Know the character of God. Know what God is capable of doing. And know what God has promised he will do. Add all it up together. And just the way he called them out of captivity, just the way he expanded them, and just the way they were once again able to experience the glory, we too can experience that glory in a dark world. We too can be lights in a dark world. We too can shine. We can recover ourselves from the snare of the devil. We got to learn how to recover ourselves. Loose him. When you hear them old sisters, they loose here. Hey, but, but it's quicken, loose here. There's something to that. Loose here. There's something to that. Hey, hey. There's something to that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Somebody taking them clothes off that clothesline, trying to steal your stuff. You come out of the house, you go, hey. Hey, and they run. Every now and then, when that hey, hey come from your belly, come on, the devil will run when they when you when hey, hey when you caught with hey, hey, come on, I'm, hey, hey, some of y'all quicken, some of y'all quicken over there in the bread aisle, some of y'all quicken over there when the price of them going down on that wallet miller, hey, 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 you know what I'm talking about. But when you catch the enemy. And I believe God is exposing the wiles of the devil so that we know how to fight the good fight of faith. Have me all are ready to enter into a new dimension of warfare. Higher heights. So Father God, I thank you today for this opportunity to share with this people. I thank you that we don't have to get lost in the emotion of the moment, but when we're gonna hear the word of the Lord process it and apply it to our lives I pray Lord God for those who have made up their mind today 
that they will take the limits off to where there'll be no limits and no boundaries that they can see the increase of the enlarging of their tent the expansion like Jabez Lord enlarge our territory bless us indeed and so father I thank you I thank you for no limit living I thank you Lord God that you are calling us into greater works for you said greater works than these shall they do because you're going to be with the father you live on the inside of each of us and us collectively father can go in diverse places and represent you all over the world thank you lord god for the message of truth and power thank you lord god for the genuine love and service that we sense amongst your people and worship and praise that we sense among your people i thank you for it you're an awesome god and i got pour your spirit out upon these people if you're in this room and you say to me today and say before god today that you're taking the limits off you're taking the limits off you're not going to be stuck in what you have always done and been doing but you want to avail yourself to do more and to align yourself properly with god so that you can see the glory of god when well, you're not bringing god nothing where well, you're coming to god and you're allowing him to take nothing and make something out of it if that's you lift your hands high in the air and i want to pray for you father you see the many hands these hands are lifted and surrendered to you take us out of the rut take us god out of captivity Lord God, we're willing to come back to you like an estranged wife. We're, we're, we're not, you're our husband. And so we're coming back, Lord God. And we're preparing your room. We're preparing the bed for you. We're preparing the house for you. We're preparing even a table for you, Lord God. Even though you prepare a table before our enemies for us. And Lord God, we want you back. Lord God, we desire to have you back. Come on in, Lord Jesus. Come on into our minds. Come on into our hearts. Come on into our situations our dilemmas come on in to our, our our fleshly desires and stuff intercept us stop it lord god we lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets us so that we can run with patience the race that is set before us thank you father god thank you for your loving kindness is better than life you are awesome in this place Come on, from your belly, let rivers flow. You take the time, begin to thank him right now for answering your prayer. Tell him thank you for welcoming you back. Tell him thank you for accepting you back. Come on, tell him thank you for loving you in spite of you. Tell him thank you for not divorcing you. Get your breakthrough. Get your breakthrough. You don't need me. Get your breakthrough. The one thing you can do is thank him. The one thing you can do is thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him for ink. Thank him for what's coming. Come on, make room for him. Make room. Make him bigger. Make room for him. Open up your heart. Open up your mind. Open up your make 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 room for him. Make room. Make room for him. You're making room for more. Make room. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No limits, no limits. and no boundaries. no boundaries. I see increase, I see increase. All, around all around me. Stretch for, Stretch for. break for, and release me. It's all around me. Stretch forth. Break forth. And release me. In love. And this is the prophetic gesture. This is for somebody that's on the brink of a miracle and you knew you were before you came in here today. This isn't for everybody, but somebody that's on the brink of a miracle. 
I need you to step out of them chairs and I just need you to feel your way and I need you to say this with us as we sing this song as barriers come down hallelujah no limits, no limits. and no boundaries no I see increase it's all around me It's all around me. Stretch forth. Break forth. And release me. Enlarge. No limits. And no boundaries. I see it great. It's all around His name, hallelujah. Bless his name, hallelujah. Bless his name, hallelujah. Come on, just the blessing of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord make what rich and no sorrow with it. Come on, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Taste and see that God is good. His mercy everlasting. His truth endure throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's no limit and no boundaries. I see increase. It's all around me. Hallelujah! Increase, 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 increase. Hallelujah! Increase more, multiply, be fruitful, come out, be separate. Increase, 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 more, make room for more, increase, increase, make room for more, make room for more, increase, increase, more, more, multiply, increase, hallelujah, hallelujah, more. No minute, no limit, no, 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 
The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. I can feel it in the atmosphere. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Come on. Woo! Come on. The blessings of the Lord is here. The blessing of the Lord is here. I can feel it in the atmosphere. The blessing of the Lord is here. The blessing of the Lord is here. Y'all didn't get that, did you? Hey. The power of the Lord is here. The power of the Lord is here. I feel it, I feel it in the atmosphere. The power of the Lord is here. The power of the Lord is here. Can y'all sit the presence? Listen. The favor of the Lord is here. The favor of the I can feel it in the atmosphere. The favor of the Lord is here. The favor of the Lord is here. Woo! Come on. The glory of the Lord is here. The glory. The glory of the Lord is here. The glory of the Lord is here. Yeah. I can feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm gonna get my blessing right now. I can feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm. Lord, 
presence. I feel his power. I feel his glory. I feel his presence. I feel his power. I feel his glory. I feel his favor. Good God Almighty, favor. Come on, I feel his favor. Make room for more. Make room for more. You can't help me. Please don't stop me. Get out of my way. Don't try to block me. I got a race to run. And I'm running by faith at the finishing line. I'm going to see God's face. I got work to do. I got lives to change. I got places to go. I got people to see. Nations to transform. Somebody open your mouth. Throw your head back. Shout. about everything that God done for me. For the things. For the things. Let me think about that thing now. You could have been dead. For the things. For the things. It could have killed you. It came to kill you. It came to destroy you. It came to take you out. He came to take you out. She came to take you out. For the things. For the things. He. He has. Had to God.
Tiffany, and we are celebrating with you if you've answered the call of God on your life and have accepted his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, you are not alone in this new journey. We here at the Potter's House are here to help guide you on your new walk with Christ. If that is you, give us a call or a text at 1-800-TPH-4JAX. That's 1-800-874-4529. And let us know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We would be more than happy to walk you through your next steps in Christ. You can also put in the chat, I accepted Jesus, and we'll reach out to you for your next step. Now, if you're interested in becoming a member, we welcome you to the Potter's House. And you can do it right here online. If you're viewing us from your computer, visit tphim.org and in the top right hand corner, click the link Become a Member and fill out the short form. If viewing us on a mobile device, go to tphim.org and in the top right hand corner, select the menu bar and then select Become a Member and follow the prompts and someone from our discipleship team will reach out to you. We thank you for joining us from wherever you may be viewing. And make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPHJAX so that you can receive alerts of when we're on the air.